from everywhere filling the air oh how they pound raising their sound on hills and dales telling their tales merry merry wild people sing songs of the cheer Christmas is here very merry 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 Christmas merry 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 Christmas on a list and on without end their joyful tone to everyone Good morning, let's stand and worship the Lord.
everybody here today, welcome to Canyons Church. I want to invite you to go with me in prayer this morning. You may be seated for just a moment. I want to lead into a time of prayer with reading Revelation 7, 9. It says, after this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And there were angels that were there around the throne, and they're praising God. This, this year, we're doing our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and the theme verse is Revelation 7, 9. And the theme is a great multitude plus you. A great multitude plus you and, and me. And the belief is this, that every single church has a role to play in reaching all the nations with the gospel. That's what the Lord has called us to as his ambassadors. Did you know that right now, 154,000 937 people on average die daily without Christ. Let that sink in for a moment. 154,937 people are dying daily without Christ. We have a great task before us, but we also see how it's going to be in the end. We're going to see uh, all these people from all over, all the nations, all the people groups of the world singing praises to Jesus around the throne. But right now, we're on the mission. Right now, he's given us a mandate, and we are privileged to be a part of that. Your generosity in giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering uh, makes it possible for uh, better than 3,623 missionaries to be on the field right now. And as we give, we're able to send out and sustain those who are there. So, our goal for 2020 is 2020. But our pastor's challenge above that is four thousand dollars and if we hit the pastor's challenge every penny goes out from canyons for missions but also i lose my hair okay and justin sings victory in jesus so we're looking forward to that we got to pull together a great multitude plus you and let's take this to the lord in prayer right now shall we let's pray father we do thank you today for the privilege of being in your house lord thank you so much for uh, allowing us to be here and to worship you. Lord, but we think about those across the globe who do not know you, who do not have a personal relationship with you. And in many cases, there's no gospel witness there at all. And often there's no scriptures in their language. Lord, give us tears of compassion. Give us a heart for the lost. Give us eyes to see. May we be willing to pray and may we be willing to give and maybe may we be willing to even go and to make Christ known to the nations for your glory. Lord, I pray that the people here that make up Canyons Church, that we would be a people who long to see you known from the heart of the Rockies to the ends of the earth. This is our cry. This is our prayer, Lord. Give us a heart for the nations. As we worship this morning, we pray that you'd be glorified in all that we do, all that we sing, in the word that is preached, in our response to it, in our giving, in everything, Lord. Be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. And the entire church family welcomes you if you are visiting with us today. We're so happy that you have chosen to worship with us. We are, if, you're, if you've been away for a while and you're coming, it's great to see old faces as well. Um, right behind you, there is a contact card in the back of the seat. If you wouldn't mind taking that contact card out and filling it out and turning it in on your way out, we have a gift for you um, on your way out as a visitor today. We also want to announce and put out for anybody that has not seen the emails uh, that we are giving out Christmas Eve service tickets. Now, these tickets are at no cost. We're just trying to keep track of numbers for COVID-related uh, concerns. So if you would like tickets, you can go to the website, and it's right on the front page. You can fill a form out there to let us know, or you can approach me after service today, and I can look um, about getting tickets for you. There are two services this year, 4.30 and 6.30. We'll also be live streaming both of those services. So lots of options to uh, come together 
and to celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus as a baby. Thank you for coming to worship with us at Canyons. Please stand up and continue in worship.
the dawn of salvation. bunch of church members who set out to perform a Christmas play, and the director who tried his hardest to just keep it all together. The Glory of Christmas. I am the longest running cast member of the Nativity Ensemble of our church. Well, I don't like to mention it, but I am a formally trained prodigy of the theater art. Having Dan as part of our cast is fantastic. Lord, I am surely blessed beyond measure. Okay, uh, okay, good. Uh, Heather, let's, uh, let's just, let's do it again, but this time with more motion, okay? Hey, I want you to Meryl Streep this up, okay? You got it. Dan thinks he's helping, but all he does is compare everything to Meryl Streep. Tony. I need you to channel your inner Meryl. My dear Mary, stop. It is... Just, I need to Meryl this over for a minute. Oh, this is no way to treat your actors. Meryl would have seen this and walked immediately. Really, Dan? Because this potato salad looks so Meryl right now. Suddenly, the most splendiferous heavenly being appeared to my cohorts and me. Stick to the script, please. Okay, Joel, it's called the glory of Christmas. I think the shepherds deserve a little more poetic language, don't you think? It's the Bible, Dan. God may beg to differ with you. By day, I make a living as an accountant, but a dedicated one. But a dedicated actor must lose themselves and fully become the character. Huh? Do you have any questions for me at all? Uh, what's that smell? Green pastures. Green pastures, Annette. I am so method. I haven't bathed in a month. You really need to take a bath. I can't. These shepherds were society's misfits, you know. They were... Sure, transfixed by um, a, a choir of angels, but also amazed that God had chosen them. They were the scrawny kid in PE. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the nerd who went alone to the prom. Yeah, they were, um, they were the glee club president. Twice. They were the least of these. Tell everyone that he sent the greatest gift ever, the Prince of Peace. 
lowest in the land is given the highest honor. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. What's that smell? Well, good morning again, everybody. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Luke's Gospel, chapter number 2, Luke chapter 2, as we continue the theme, The Glory of Christmas. And as you can see on the screen, the key question and the title of this message this morning is, What's That Smell? What's That Smell? It was the key question in the uh, video that we just watched. Ironically, it's also the key question on any youth trip in a church van. If you've ever been there. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, we've been there. What's that smell? Uh, in the locker room when you play football. I, I remember that as well. Um, by the way, um, Pastor Justin lost his smell and taste back in March. Didn't have COVID, but lost his smell and taste. He's still trying to get it back. It's coming back a little bit. But if he goes on any youth trips, I think that's going to come in really handy. Uh, so... When I grew up, I grew up in North Georgia, country church, out where there's farmland all around, and when we would have guests at our church, they would come out of the church building and the smell would hit them in the face, the smell of country, you know, and they would be like, what's that smell? And all the chicken farmers in the church would say, smells like money to me. <laughs> when we think about what's that smell, you know, it's a question that mamas has to have to ask a lot, isn't it? What's that smell? You ever notice that a mama will never ask her kid, can I smell your shirt? And then the mama smells the shirt and says, oh, you're good for another week. Does a mama ever do that? <laughs> no. What's that smell? Well, that was the question that was asked of Dan at least two times, who plays the role of the shepherd in the video. But Dan really is picking up on something significant here. The shepherds, in biblical days, frankly, they probably did smell. I mean, they were outside, they were working in the fields, they were tending the sheep. Um, they, they probably smelled quite a bit, but yet, God chose them for a very special task. And I want you to look with me here in Luke's Gospel, and I'm going to read verses 8 through 20 to give us the context this morning. Beginning with verse 8, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. When we come to this text this morning, I want you to look again at verse number 10 for just a moment. And I want you to notice the angel of the Lord is standing before the shepherds, and the angel of the Lord is bringing this message. And verse 10 says, for look, or behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. And then, if you fast forward to verse 17, 
It says, they reported the message, the message they were told. Let's talk about the message this morning. What was that message that they were told? Who, who is this message for? What is the message and what are we to do with that message? Those are going to be some questions that Justin and I are going to attempt to answer this morning as we look at the scripture. So the first question is, who is this message for? And the answer that we see very clearly in scripture is that this message is for all. Who is it for? It's for all. It's the clear answer here in scripture. So get the picture. Mary had given birth to Jesus. She had wrapped him lightly in cloth and laid him in a manger or an animal's feeding trough. And as such, Nobody knew that Jesus, the Messiah, had come, that he had even been born, except for Joseph, Mary, and whatever animals happened to be standing around in that cave that they were in, in that stable, at that place. And so, if it's only Joseph and Mary and these animals that know, and and by the way, maybe there were some cows, or maybe there were some goats, or maybe some sheep, or donkeys. One uh, nativity scene in Texas had an armadillo in it. I'm not real sure how accurate that is. But anyhow, if, if only the animals and Mary and Joseph knew, then there was going to need to be some kind of announcement made. The news was going to have to be shared. It was a silent night as we sing about in Bethlehem. Casting Crowns wrote these words, And while you're lying in the dark, there shines an everlasting light. For the king has left his throne and is sleeping in a manger tonight. O Bethlehem, what you have missed while you were sleeping. For God became a man and stepped into your world today. So if an announcement was going to have to be made because everybody was sort of sleeping through this night, not knowing that Messiah had come, how would that go down? Well, let me say this real fast. When Valerie and I had our first baby, Anna, We were so excited. We looked forward to being able to send out birth announcements to all our friends and family. Who's done that before? Some of you sent out birth announcements? Yeah. And so we weren't the only ones that had done that. There are many who had done that before us. But this may very well be the first example of a birth announcement. Because you see, God sends out this birth announcement here in Scripture. While Jesus had been born of Mary, the shepherds were out in the fields and they were keeping watch over their flock and God sent an angel who appeared before these shepherds and the glory of the Lord shone all around them and it was overwhelming to say the least and these shepherds were terrified but it was not the goal of the angel to scare them to death it was the goal of the angel to share the good news that would lead to life that's why the angel was there and so in verse 10 the angel says don't be afraid don't be afraid for Look, or behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. Now stop there for just a second. Good news of what kind of joy? Great joy. Not a little bit of joy, but great joy. Have you ever seen somebody sing, I've got the joy like this? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. No, you got to sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. Didn't have that plan. That's good. Time out. (laughs) Anyway, this wasn't a little bit of joy. This was big joy, great joy. And the angel says, I proclaim to you great good news of great joy. And help me with this. See, you can preach this message. You ready? That will be for who? All the people. It's It's not a message of good news for a select few. It's, it's not that, it's for all people, anyone who will come. The angel is saying it's not only for you, it's for them. It's not just for you, it's for the world. It's not a message just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. It's not a message that's just for the religious crowd, it's also for the sinners, which by the way we all are. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so to make the point, God sent out his birth announcement. And when God sent out his birth announcement, he did not announce it in the temple. He did not announce it in the synagogue. He did not announce it to the religious crowd. To illustrate this message is for all. God chose to make it known to the shepherds. 
out in a field. The shepherds, a people who, if they walked in the room, you might say, what's that smell? That's who God chose to reveal the birth of His Son to. As we heard in the video, the shepherds were society's misfits. They were the scrawny kid in P.E. or the nerd by himself at the prom. They were considered the least of these. And yet, here they are, chosen by God to be the recipient of good news. And they were no doubt amazed that God had chosen them. And in choosing them, there's a message that goes out to all of us. And the message is it doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how tall you are. It doesn't matter how short you are. Oh, what a relief it is. It doesn't even matter how you smell. The good news is that Jesus has come for all people, for you, for me, for anyone who will come and receive his free gift of salvation and eternal life that's offered. And the great thing about Scripture is we don't just see that here in Luke 2. We see it consistently throughout the New Testament. And so Pastor Justin's going to help us see that for just a moment. Yeah, there, uh, specifically, I'd, I'd like you guys to turn to Second Peter. Keep your thumb at Luke 2. But turn to Second Peter chapter 3 with me. And we're going to read verse 9. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, this is what it says. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So in 2 Peter, Peter is writing for two reasons. There are two reasons why Peter is writing. The first reason is he is writing to stir up or to wake up believers who have fallen into an ineffective, unfruitful Christian life. So that's his first reason. His second reason for writing is that he is warning of false teachers in the church. And guess what? They are false teachers that are sitting side by side with the believers in the church. And those false teachers, they had two specific teachings that they were um, telling the church. The first was to pursue desires of the flesh, and they also despised authority. Does that sound familiar to anyone here? Does that sound like maybe the wheel keeps on turning? I see brothers and sisters burdened under teachers who ignore proper Christian living and teachers who reject oversight and authority. And as Peter says, it's to their swift destruction. The reality is this, and I bring this up because it's right here in this verse in Peter, Second Peter. God will not suffer this sinful world forever. God will not suffer this sinful world forever. His wrath is being stored up. You know, I think we hold too dearly to God's promise to Noah to not flood the earth again. But we ignore God's promise to consume the world with fire next. That's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, just above where we are now. That day will be a day when the heavens dissolve and the elements will melt with heat. That's verse 12 of chapter 3. It's coming. It's coming. But Second Peter isn't all doom and gloom and zoom. Or noom. Or noom. Yeah. No, while Peter doesn't shy away from the destruction that is coming, he doesn't shy away from that. He's also sure to encourage the believer with the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. This is what he said, God is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God is patient because he desires all to come to repentance. Again, God will not suffer this sinful world forever, but I have some good news. Our God is long-suffering. 
and he is patient. And he does not desire for any to perish. And you, sitting right where you are, are invited to come to him, to turn from your way, to go his way. And I just want you to listen to one of the most famous passages in Scripture. John three sixteen through 18. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the message, my friends. And guess what? The message is good news. So what you're hearing this morning right there in that text is, first of all, you've got to understand there's bad news, right? Bad news has to exist before you can have good news. The good news is that it, the, this is for all. But we also see, as Pastor Justin just said, that the message is good news. Verse 10, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news. Who needs a cup of coffee? Good news. And what is the message? Verse 11, today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is Messiah the Lord. There had been a messianic, expectation that one day the king, the Messiah, would come. And all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament, it was pointing towards his coming. And now, in the field, we're finding out that he has come. It's not one day, it's this day. It's not one day, it's this night, right here. And where is he coming to? It says, the city of David. This, of course, is a reference to the city of Bethlehem, the very place that David, King David, and his family were from. 1 Samuel 16 says that David was the son of Jesse of Bethlehem. David would have tended sheep as a little shepherd boy out in that same hillside, in those same fields that these shepherds were now in. Bethlehem was also the place where Saul anointed the next king of Israel. So today in Bethlehem, a Savior was born for you who is Messiah the Lord. A Savior, one who will save people from their sins. He's Messiah, he's Lord, and the angel is sharing this birth announcement of God, that he will be born in the city of David. Watch this, this is, this is awesome. The son of David has been born in the city of David. David who was a shepherd boy that became king, in that same city that he's from, the king would come and it would be announced to the shepherds. Full circle, God makes it known. The Savior was born for you. The Savior was born for me. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. But the shepherds not only uh, received this good news, but... You know, again, they needed to go and they needed to see for themselves what God had done. And so God says to them through the angel to go and see. Verse 12 says, this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. You remember two weeks ago, we talked about Isaiah seven fourteen, And there was a word in there translated sign. And we talked about how a sign is a distinguishing mark. It's something that sets it apart. And so the sign in Isaiah 7, 14 is that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a child, to a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. Well, here in Luke's gospel, we also see another sign. It's another distinguishing mark. You will find this babe wrapped snugly in cloth and laying in a manger, laying in an animal's feeding trough. Now, there's a good chance that in Bethlehem on that night, there were lots of babies in the city, and they were sleeping. It, there's, a, there's a chance, I don't know, maybe there was even other babies born that night. We, we just don't know that, do we? 
But this sign sets Jesus apart. You know, there may have been other babies, there may have been other babies born that night, but I doubt very seriously that anywhere else in Bethlehem is there a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and laying in a feeding trough. And so it was a sign. And they were sent to see what would happen. And as soon as that sign was given, suddenly, with the angel, there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts, verse 13, and they're praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people He favors. We see a heavenly affirmation of what's just been heard and what's been announced. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like, you know, when the preacher preaches and it's really good and it's really true and, man, you just get so excited, you say, Amen. I'm glad two of you were excited. And so the angels, they just can't hold back their praises of God as salvation is coming. The king has come. God wrapped in human flesh. And they sing and they cry out. And as they turn loose praising God, it's a reminder, that's what worshipers do. They praise God. They sing praises to Him. And so, Pastor Justin mentioned John 3.16. Who will be saved? Everyone who believes on Jesus for salvation. Let me, let me take that a little further. Romans 3.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And that's why Jesus had to die on the cross in our place to die that death on our behalf as a substitute. And then the next part of that verse is this, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is easy to understand by an illustration that fits the season we're in. Maybe at your house there's a Christmas tree, and maybe under that Christmas tree there's a gift. And maybe under that Christmas tree there's a gift that has your name on it. That gift is for you. It's wrapped up, it's been purchased it's there for you, but that gift does not become yours until you receive it as your own. And the Bible says, to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. Jesus paid the price for us on the cross of Calvary. That gift has been wrapped up. It's been purchased. It's under the tree, but you have to come and get it. And receive it for yourself. Jesus died for everyone. But the only ones who will be saved are those who come to him. And receive that free gift that he is offering. And when we come to him. By the way, Dan the shepherd said this is the greatest gift ever given. And when we come to him and we receive this greatest gift ever given. Here's what happens. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Anyone who is in Christ is a new Creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he adds in verse 19 that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, bringing us together. Filling in that gap that separated us from God. Jesus built the bridge and we're made one with God again when we come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, the message is for all. The message is good news, but we have to receive it. And when we receive him, the Prince of Peace comes to live in us. We come to, know, we come to have peace with God and as we walk with him, we can have the peace of God. Okay, So the message is for all. And the message is good news. When we've received that message, though, what are we to do with it? Are we to just hoard it? Are we to just keep it for ourselves? Tell us, Pastor. No, the message has been entrusted to us as it was entrusted to the shepherds. Let's look um, back in Luke chapter 2 in verse 15. You know, Dan in our clip, he so eloquently said at the end, God entrusted the shepherds with the most important message that's ever been kept if the message is for all and the message is good news, then we cannot keep it to ourselves. In verse 15, we see that the shepherds hurried to see if what the angel said was true. And I want you to notice something here and hear me on this. It's okay and it's completely appropriate to check things out. The shepherds were told that something miraculous had happened. They were told where they could find the miracle, and so they went. And I just want to tell you, 
don't be afraid to investigate. Jason and I both can sit here and guarantee the promises of God check out. Jason and I can sit here and tell you that Scripture is trustworthy. Just go do some research. We can sit here and tell you Jesus really did die on the cross, and he really did come back to life. It's historically verifiable. Just do some research. It's okay to investigate, just like the shepherds did. The shepherds also relayed what they had been told as we see in verses 17 and 18, if you look there. You see, the truth was too incredible not to share. Um, The shepherds' arrival was confirmation enough that the angelic message was true and did happen. How else and why else would a group of shepherds, a bunch of stinky men, show up in Bethlehem looking for a newborn child, knowing specifically that he would be wrapped tightly and lying in a manger? Notice again in verse 19, Mary treasured these things in her heart. It was a special confirmation of who her son truly is. Think about it. Angels were sent to shepherds announcing the birth of the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. The hardship of the past nine months was worth it. Mary wasn't crazy. It's all true. Maybe you've gone through something hard. Um, And maybe like Mary, the hardship was due to something that God asked you to do. Perhaps it was a call to ministry, and so you went off to seminary and you studied real hard, you graduated, and then there weren't many opportunities to do ministry after that. Maybe you left a job that wasn't honoring to the Lord, but now you're having a difficult time finding work and providing for your family. Here's one. Maybe you left the LDS church and have been distanced from your family over that departure. Maybe your family even rejects you now, or at least the relationships that were once warm, those relationships, maybe they are now cold. Maybe you've spent months or even years wondering if you really were doing what God asked you to do, or Maybe did you just bring that suffering upon yourself? Whatever it is, whatever it is you're wondering about this morning, I want you to see the Lord's faithfulness to Mary in confirmation and comfort and provision. And I want to tell you, he will surely give you the same. If not today, maybe tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, one day, he will. Maybe it will be as you kneel at his feet in his presence. Regardless, God is faithful. He will confirm and comfort and provide for you just like he did for Mary. Notice what the shepherds did after visiting Bethlehem. In verse 20, what did they do? They returned. Where? Where did they return? Where they'd come from. Where they'd come from, that's right. So they went back to their fields, and I think that's kind of amazing. I imagine if I had been visited by a host of angels, been told about the coming of the Messiah, been sent to him, knelt before him, I might assume that I am now a special envoy, and I need to take this to the world, and now I'm specially commissioned. It wouldn't be far-fetched for them to do that, but what did they do instead? What do the shepherds do? They returned home. They went back to their fields, and guess what? They were still special envoys. I can guarantee that those shepherds told this story for the rest of their lives. They took the message with them. It was entrusted to them for good reason. Coming to know Jesus is no less special than getting a message from angels. And we all have been entrusted with the message. You know, it's easy to assume that the pastors are the only full-time ministers, but I don't want you to fall into that trap. If you trust Christ, the message has been entrusted to you. 
to take with you wherever you go, to share with all people, because the good news must be shared. I want you guys to turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Jason read from there and talked about new creation in Christ. The passage continues on. I'm going to pick it up at the end of verse 19. So that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at the end of verse 19. It says, And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Literally, the verse says, As he established among us the word of reconciliation. And so we make that a little smoother and we say he has committed the message. He has entrusted the message of reconciliation. And he's, done, he's, in, he's entrusted that to us. And I think there's implications included in being entrusted with such a messenger, which Paul actually describes in this passage. He says that we are ambassadors. This is verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Um, an ambassador represents a people or ruler from whom they're sent. Um, actually, Time Magazine has uh, an article of the 10 most embarrassing t diplomatic moments in history. In one of the entries, it reads this, running a country can be very boring work. Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, was famous for falling asleep in public, especially, especially during musical performances. But at least he was never caught on video. Former President Bill Clinton wasn't so lucky. When the bleary-eyed dignitary fell asleep during a 2008 memorial for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his mid-speech nap time was recorded for all the world to see. Imagine that. Going back a bit, when Peter was writing to the church, I told you this at the beginning, do you remember what the first of his two reasons for writing was? To stir up the believers. That's right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Peter was writing to stir up the believers, and the word literally means wake up. Wake up, which implies there were people sleeping. Peter was writing to stir up or to wake up the ineffective, unfruitful, dare I, dare I say, sleeping believer. Are you a sleeping believer this morning? Not literally. If you are literally sleeping, maybe wake up. We're getting towards the end here. But no, think about it. Are you a sleeping believer? Are you sleeping on the job as an ambassador for Christ? The message has been entrusted to you. Wake up. This is news that's too good not to share. Share it with all who will listen. If you're here today and you have not trusted Jesus to save you from your sin, we plead with you just as Paul pleads in verse 20 of 2 Corinthians 5, be reconciled to Christ. We have all sinned, and there is no way we can pay for it or make it up or do enough to get rid of that sin. It's only by trusting the one who did not know sin but became sin for us. That's verse 21. It's only through him, Jesus, that you can be reconciled to God. It's only through Jesus you can have your sins forgiven. But listen, the good news isn't just forgiveness, as Ryan Simpson might say, but wait, there's more. Through Jesus, our sin is forgiven, yes, but in Jesus, we have the ability to become the righteousness of God. That's the end of verse 21 there. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. You see, the slate isn't just wiped clean. The debt hasn't just been paid. It's not just a fresh start, so make sure you don't mess it up this time. No, in Christ, we actually become the righteousness of God. The debt of sin has been paid and you have been given an American Express Centurion card, the most exclusive credit card in the world, one that only the uber-wealthy get. 
in Christ, you are made the righteousness of God. Let me finish this point that the message is entrusted to us with Paul's words in Romans chapter 5, and they'll be brought up on the, the screen here. But God proves his own love for us. Hey, Josh. Sorry, bud. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. This is the good news of the message that's for all, and it has been entrusted to us. As we finish up here, um, you know when Justin and I came up to preach earlier, um, the, the worship team sang a song, Here Comes Heaven. You remember that? I tried my best to get them to add a little addendum to that and, and say, Here comes Justin. They wouldn't do it. But aren't you glad that when you came to Jesus, if you know him, aren't you glad that when you came to him, he didn't say, what's that smell? Aren't you glad he didn't say, who are you? What do you think you're doing coming? Aren't you glad that he welcomed you with arms open wide? Stories told of a man and his wife, they were in a car, Huge snowstorm, they were stuck, snow was piling up, they had nowhere to go, and they froze to death in their car in that blizzard, buried the vehicle, and just before she died, the woman scribbled a note on a piece of paper and stuffed it in the glove compartment, and the note read, I don't want to die this way. What made the story even more sad was right within view, if they could have seen it, was a bus that was also stranded, and in it were festive passengers who remained warm throughout the whole night, so close yet so far away. Now I wonder this morning which position you may be in. Are you like the one sitting in the cold car, and when it comes to knowing Jesus, you're on the outside, you, you don't really know him? I want you to know that you don't have to sit there in the car. That you can run to the warm bus. That Jesus is waiting with arms open wide for you. And then on the other hand, if you do know Jesus and you are in the warm bus, then you need to understand we don't need to be comfortable and we don't need to be content in that warm bus when we are surrounded by those who are cold. And by that I mean who are dying in their sins without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ while we sit in comfort. The message of the shepherds is this. Know Him and make Him known. Go and tell the good news of Jesus. Will you pray with me? I do thank you for the privilege of being able to be a child of yours, not because of my own merit, of what I've done, but because of what you have done on the cross. Lord, I pray for any man, woman, boy or girl within the sound of my voice who needs to have that personal relationship with you and they don't have it. I pray that today they would cry out to you. They would leave this place with the assurance that you are their Savior. Lord, I pray for us that already know that you would give us tears for the loss, compassion for those who are dying apart from you. Break our hearts, Lord, for the lost. And Lord, may we be your ambassadors in this world. Thank you for speaking to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I would invite you to stand and as we sing.
This is a song of worship. This is a song of responding to Him. But also, if you need to come pray, won't you come? We're here. Uh, If you need to receive Christ today, we would love to pray with you. Let's come during this time of invitation. here this morning. Were you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Hey, don't forget this. We have our Christmas Eve service. You heard Pastor Justin mention it earlier. Um, If you've been in canyons a long time, you know that the traditional hour is at six o'clock that we have our Christmas Eve service. So pay attention. There's two services this year. One is at 430 and the second one is at 630. Okay. And so you can see Pastor Justin about tickets. They're free. Um, You can email the church office, you can go on the website, you have lots of options. But we would like for you to request tickets for your whole party so we can keep up with how many people are coming to which service, okay? It's going to be a great night. Brother Terry Thurman is our deacon on call today. He's going to close us in a word of prayer. If you'll come up here, Terry, so the the wonderful live stream people can see your smile. Actually, they can't, you've got a mask on. God, we're so grateful to be your children and uh, to be forgiven. And uh, Lord, uh, I think I was touched today 
to see those people around me um, at work, neighbors, family that don't know you. And uh, Lord, uh, help me to just keep that in mind, God, that they need you, that they need someone to tell them. And we've experienced you and life in you, and we're the ones uh, to do that. And Father, help us just to have eyes to see and see them and hearts to just to feel their pain and, and their need. And uh, Lord, just uh, be with us in that way, God. And uh, we'll thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.